Hi, my name's Nicola White. I'm a mudlark and artist. Um, those of you that watch my channel regularly will know that one of my favourite places to be is on the Thames foreshore at low tide. Well, another favourite place of mine to spend time in is in this beautiful forest, which is very close to where I live. It's called Oxley's Wood. And some of the trees here are hundreds of years old. And there's something very energising about walking through this forest amongst all these beautiful trees, particularly at the moment because it's autumn and the colours are glorious. Oranges, yellows, reds, and there's squirrels and parakeets and it's just a really beautiful experience. And you know what? There's actually more to trees than meets the eye. And I found out an awful lot about trees the other day when I went to meet a couple and had a long conversation with them all about trees. And I'm going to introduce you to them now. Hello, my name is Nicola White. I'm a mudlark and artist, and I'm here today with Simon and Tracy West, who run the charity Word Forest, which is a UK-based charity which works to combat the devastating effect of global warming and climate change through planting trees. Now, Simon and Tracy, I understand that it started um, when you planted some trees for your wedding. Yeah. So please, can you tell me how your project has evolved and why plant trees? Okay, well, um, it evolved from the wedding forest that we had planted into doing um, a literary competition back in 2013, we started 2014, where we were planting a tree for everybody that entered. So each person that put a, an entry into the competition we would not only plant a tree, but send them the GPS coordinates of that tree. Um, our friend that was organising the tree planting thought we were mad and that we wouldn't get anybody enter for that, but we got a thousand entries in the first year. Um, so we sent a load of money to Kenya to have people plant trees. And by the third year of doing the Literary Prize competition, we knew we wanted to formalise and become a charity to go the whole year wanting to expand it, wanting to put more trees in the ground, knowing that trees are our best option, our cheapest, simplest option for mitigating the climate crisis. Um, it was just so disheartening to have to wait another 12 months. So we just said, right, let's do it. And we, we founded Word Forest. Word Forest because it was, it was, it started with trees and words. It, it, it was born from words, you know? Um, and yeah, but that was our kind of our, our entry point into it, which seems like a long time ago. <laughs> Trees, so what do they do to combat climate change? Yeah, uh, well, every time they grow, uh, all they are really is solidified air. They absorb carbon dioxide, extract the carbon out of it to make their own structure. So if we plant a tree here in London or where we live down in East Devon, then it will do exactly that job and it'll absorb the carbon dioxide locally. If we plant them in Africa, around the tropical regions, then they'll do exactly the same, but they'll grow up to 10 times quicker. Now, people often say, well, but that's just helping the Kenyan atmosphere. Well, it isn't, because it all blows around the whole of the world. So if we absorb CO2 there, it reduces the levels for us. So we plant lots and lots and lots of trees in Africa. In fact, the first, we, had, we, we ran two uh, international reforestation conferences in Kenya. And we caught the, the name for them was obvious. It's the, the Clear the Air Conference because it's, it's clearing the air. You know, those trees in Kenya, 5,000 miles away from here, are affecting extreme weather events globally. And they're cleaning the air we breathe all over the planet. And the more trees we can get there in that, that, that region, the better. We all benefit from that. We'll all benefit from more stable weather, less of the extremes. OK, so why do we need to get the carbon out of the atmosphere? What's wrong with it? Well, we actually um, have our Kenyan people teaching local Kenyan farmers why this is the case, because the carbon dioxide forms a sort of blanket. It's a greenhouse style blanket. So you've heard of greenhouse gases. Yes. That's because they act just like that. They perform a barrier in the atmosphere when the carbon dioxide is up high and the sunlight comes in and it can't get back out again. So it, it bounces off the carbon dioxide and comes back down. So the more carbon dioxide in the air, the more the sunlight is trapped on the earth. So everything gets warmer. 
Uh, people also talk about, well, what this one and a half degrees, you know, it wouldn't matter if we're one and a half degrees warmer, that would be quite nice. But actually, that's a really serious thing when it's on an average basis. If you imagine your body temperature at 36.7 degrees, if you were one and a half degrees up on average, you'd go, I've got a temperature. If you were two degrees up, you'd say, I'm quite ill. If you were three degrees up, you'd be phoning the doctor and saying, I'm really ill, I need to take something to bring this down. It's exactly the same with our planet. The planet's going to survive no matter what we do. Humans are going to be affected greatly by a small increase in temperature. I, th I think one of the things that um, Simon alludes to as well is, uh, we've talked about the extremes of temperature, of, of, of monsoons, of rainfall, of floods and all the other bits and pieces. But the bit that people forget about and is very, very relevant and will become more so as the years go on is the human and wildlife migration that come as a result of X. So X happens and Y is <laughs> this huge amount of people and creature that need to move to somewhere else to live. And when that actually starts to happen on, I think, the UK's shores um, around Cambridge, for example, and um, Norfolk and the flat areas ar around the UK, then we'll really, the governments, I think, will sit up and say, oh, hang on a minute, what's going on? Um, we really need to do something about this and let's move it a bit quicker. And they should be moving with that urgency now. People are losing the islands that they live on. They're losing their homesteads around the planet. But because it's a long, long way away, I feel there's just a disconnect. They're not really holding on to that's going to be us if we just don't get on and do something serious about removing the CO2 from the atmosphere and locking it down. It's draw down and lock in, which is what those trees outside here have been doing for, I don't know, we guesstimate about 70, 80 years, the size of these trees. And they're, of course, locking in not just the CO2, but nitrous oxide from the, from the, from the um, vehicles, although not so much these days because it's the... Ultra low emissions. Yeah, zone, absolutely. Yeah. But of course, you've still got uh, th that's what they're doing. And they're giving us this wonderful clean air to breathe. The green spaces in London are so critical that yeah. we hold on to them and make sure that those beautiful, mature, that beautiful, mature stock does not get cut down. I think part of one of the things we like to do is to make people think about their own spaces, their green spaces. You know, ref think about the trees in Kenya. Yeah, they're vital. Mm -hmm. But the ones in our own homesteads, the ones in our villages, and certainly up here in London, we need every one of them. Mm -hmm. So try and be a voice for the voiceless trees yeah. where you can. A voice for the trees. And yes, like you said, clearing the air. That's yeah. really what they do. I've got this lovely image in my mind now of these trees just sucking in this carbon and clearing the air. And you, know, you look at these trees and you think, oh, that, that's nice. They look lovely. But it's um, the role that they're playing is they're just so very yeah, important. Air conditioners literally and all you have to do planet. is walk down a London street in the summer when it's really hot with mm -hmm. no trees mm -hmm. and then go into one with trees and feel the difference. Mm -hmm. Just walking in dappled shade, it's so wonderful. And it makes a lovely difference in the middle of a city, just having a few trees. Thank you for giving the trees a voice in this interview to say what they can do because they're just silent things aren't they that we take them for granted that we've always got the green stuff around us yeah. and we just don't realize how critical they are haven't even touched on biodiversity of course no. yeah the wildlife and the birds that need yeah. them so desperately it's, it's like a big knock-on effect isn't it, it is it and absolutely is i mean i love trees ever since um, being a young child i've loved climbing trees <laughs> i used to have an orchard um and i went i was in california a while back and i went to muir i don't know how you say it actually muir muir i'm sure somebody's going to tell me muir woods i think it's muir and the trees there are absolutely incredible they're just so huge mm. and um really majestic i mean they are they are wonderful and to think that they play such an important we, role. we do tend not to notice them in our own environments until yeah. something happens yeah. to them these trees outside here are older than older than we are, they're older than, yeah, I know, but they're doing a superb job and they've been there a long time here, is hoping they continue to grow and aren't cut down in the name of another building that needs to grow yeah. because we need, the, we need that carbon locked in. If a, tree is grow, if a tree is grown, cut and then used to make something with the wood, of course, all the carbon's still locked in it. 
I mean, that's great. It's yeah. when it's cut and then chopped down or burned that it. Oh, then it really. Yeah, we go back to we go back to square one. Yeah. So there are beams of wood in Ely Cathedral that are nearly 500 years old, and the trees that they were cut from were probably another 500 years old when they were cut down. Yeah. So that's thousand-year-old locking in of this dangerous so carbon hard. dioxide. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, if we do that and look after the timber, the problem comes if you cut it down and burn it or yeah. cut it down and then put it in a, a skip where it, it gets eaten by bugs and uh, it just goes back into the atmosphere. Mm. Now, it can be quite overwhelming for people to hear about global warming and climate change and all that. And it's, it's very difficult to know how to deal with it sometimes. Um, what can you suggest people can do on an individual basis and, and can we be hopeful and positive and optimistic about it? Yeah, certainly. I mean, on an individual basis, uh, if you start looking at everything in your life, then it will be overwhelming. But if you just do one thing, um, we, we would obviously recommend people find a way to get a tree planted, mm -hmm. whether it's one in your own environment or whether you pay for one to be planted in the tropical zones, because in the tropical zones, they grow 10 times faster. So it makes sense if you want to absorb CO2, plant one somewhere like Kenya. Um, we'd be very happy to plant trees on people's behalf. Yeah. So you can do that. It, there are other things like, for example, we know, scientists know, and, and people are beginning to understand that eating um, meat-based diet fully is bad for the planet. Meat is a very intensive carbon dioxide generating process, growing meat is. If you have plant-based food, one day a week. And can Just, you still have nice food being a Oh vegan? my God, are you kidding me? Is it all boring and beans? Do I look like, like a, I'm a, like do I look like I don't eat well? <laughs> we eat amazing food, yeah. we eat amazing food. And there are some superb alternatives um, out there for people that if they say, well, I really love my sausages or I love my pies and I can't get, well, there's, there's alternatives for those if you want them. So I was talking to someone last night about groats, mm, groats. which is a groats. Groats is an ancient British grain. So it's basically oats that haven't been rolled yet. Oh. So they're like, they're a rice alternative mm -hmm. if you want. We use them as a rice alternative and they're gorgeous. Groats. Groats, yeah. yeah. But and they're the quite hard to get hold of. They haven't been shipped from yeah. the, the Middle East and the Far East. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you, Simon and Tracy, so much for talking to me today. And everyone, I'd welcome your comments and your thoughts on this. And just lastly, where can people find out more about what you do? Uh, well, there's a couple of places. Um, if they've enjoyed this conversation, then I think they might enjoy meeting the Mothers of the Forest. Okay. So the Mothers of the Forest are the women that we um, have a, a women's empowerment group, Mothers of the Forest, in Kenya, in, in Mothers Empowerment Groups, rather, sorry, in Kenya. And they're the ones that do the tree planting. Okay. Um, and then we had a film made in 2018, 2019. 2019 sorry thank you oh, time goes uh, and it's narrated by Kate Winslet so if you go to hashtag trees are the key on YouTube okay. free to watch um, and that'll certainly that will show you what we're doing firsthand there's a little bit of Simon and I in it digging some holes doing some tree planting and just talking about how those trees in the tropics can really change our world for the for the good and not only that it shows how it changes their lives by having food, by being able to, you know, dent poverty, by having fruit trees and all sorts of other things. Um, anyway, that's trees are the key. Or go to our website, which is www.wordforest.org. We're a good team, aren't we? Great. <laughs> Did you get that, everyone? Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for coming and uh, keep up the amazing work. Thank you Thanks so you much for having us on today. Mm -hmm.